Hello and good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Carly Copley and I'm the Prevention Specialist at the Women's Center. As many of you are aware, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. You may see people wearing purple or purple ribbons in support of survivors and their allies everywhere. Historically, coercion and manipulation are some of the tools utilized by people who perpetuate domestic and interpersonal violence, especially in group settings. For this reason, tonight we hope to bring you a bit of education about early and intermediate warning signs of abusive behavior in individual and group settings. Abuse can happen to anyone. I'm gonna say that again because I think that that's very important to know. Abuse can happen to anyone. I want to remind those watching at home that we serve the whole community at the Women's Center, not just women. For that reason, soon we, we will be changing our name to reflect our values. Again, we serve all survivors and their nonviolent family members who are, are impacted by the trauma of abuse. If you are in immediate danger, please call 911 to get immediate help. If you need to seek advocacy, counseling, or education for current or past abuse and are not in immediate danger, please reach out to our hotline. It's 1-800-334-2094. Again, the number is 1-800-334-2094. We are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If you would like to create a community safety plan or start a, a conversation about community care and safety, you can reach out to me. Again, my name is Carly Copley. I'm the prevention specialist. You can reach me at extension 264. The, the Women's Center appreciates our Southern Illinois community, communities and we our sole existence. The reason that we do it exist is to empower our survivors of violence. Tonight, we will be discussing coercive control and manipulation in group settings. Specifically, what makes a group utilize coercive control and which manipulation tactics are most commonly used? I want to welcome our panelists who have bravely decided to be here with us to help educate on this topic tonight. On our panel, we will have T. Brown, Elizabeth Donahue, and Rose Berkman. Our first panelist is T. Brown. T. Brown is a musician, a father, and a performance artist. He is currently studying for his Master's of Arts in Performance Studies at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. He is also a survivor of a 23-year stint in a Carbondale-based, high-demand community. He has an intimate relationship with coercion and manipulation at the hands of a religious leader. For this next part of his life, he hopes to contribute to the resilience of survivors of abuse through performance, teaching, and writing about his experience. Again, I just wanna thank T. Brown for being one of our panelists. Our next panelist is Elizabeth Donahue. Elizabeth Donahue is originally from the Gulf Coast region, but has been a longtime resident of Carbondale. She has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's of Science from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and has worked in the academic and nonprofit sector for most of her professional life. She currently works with students at SIU, where she also serves on the SIU Sustainability Council. She has produced and hosted a, locally, a local environmentally focused radio show. If you've um, heard of Greenhouse Rebellion, that's the one on WDX for over 10 years. Elizabeth has been involved in a wide range of community organizing and activist endeavors over the years. In the last year, she has become more vocal about our experience in recovery from a high demand group. 
She is pr the proud mother of an SIU freshman. Um, and when not working, she still enjoys exploring the local nature of the region. Again, thank you, Elizabeth, for being here this evening. Um, our final panelist this evening is a colleague of mine, uh, Rose Berkman. Rose Robinson Berkman is a child advocate and counselor in the domestic violence program at the Women's Center. She works with kids and parents who have been exposed to violence. She has a master's um, in social work and is a trauma fellow through the SIU Medical Center for Rural Health and Social Service Development. Her focus is on helping clients regain agency and ability and the ability to communicate their needs. She is passionate about educating the community on interpersonal violence and saying hi to pets that show up during Zoom meetings. Um, thanks again, Rose, for being here tonight. But, um, we're lucky to have each and every one of you on our panel this evening. So as we start the forum, I will specifically name a panelist to start the discussion topic. Then I will name two other panelists to respond as well uh, until we get into like a natural flow state with our conversation. To provide the framework, I mostly looked at the research of sociologist Yanya Lalich, who I'm, I'm told is tuning in this evening. So thank you so much for being here. Um, which brings us to one of our guiding questions. What makes a group a cult or defines cult-like behavior? So according to professor of sociology, Yanya Lalich, um, cults or cult-like groups have three defining characteristics that we will discuss at length with our panelists, noting their own personal studies and or their professional knowledge. That being said, the first thing people usually notice about a group that they consider to be dangerous, manipulative, or coercive is the leader. So, a cult-like group or a cult is a social movement that is led by a charismatic leader who utilizes authoritarian control and demands to be revered as a god or a godlike figure. This brings us to my first question for the panelists. What are your personal experiences with authoritarian leaders? I would like T to start this discussion and then Elizabeth and Rose to answer in that order, please. Carly, thanks so much. Uh, you're really, I'm, I just wanna say I'm so impressed with the structure of this and I know this is not about you, but I just wanna say, say thank you. Um, okay. This is such a huge question and I just, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, let me just let me just be let me just be specific about this question. Um, there's definitely this feeling like I want to tell all of it, but um, I was part of a group here in town in Carbondale, and the charismatic leader is inseparable from the dynamics of the group. Like it would, there would definitely not be. The group wouldn't. The group was driven, created, and built by one charismatic human being, and all the followers, you know, learned how to be devotees of the group from him, from his lead, from his feedback, from his admonitions. So, where the people in the group were really powerful in, in getting me involved and getting me to stay. Those relationships were powerful. It, it's the, the leader who made it all happen. And he's, I think one of the things I've learned since I left the group is that there's an absolutely huge parallel in domestic violence, intimate violence um, groups. You know, we see it in political parties. We, one of the things I wanna say, say straight off is if you're, if you are a human being, <laughs> there are many, many different ways that you will experience this kind of 
coercive control. Um, not just the word cult can be a little bit, it, it can feel sort of like, like it's this unique niche, neat niche kind of experience. And it's, it's really not, it's something that I see in a lot of different areas. So to answer this question, I would say, um, yes, godlike, uh, this particular guru that I was in relationship with has a very elaborate story which justifies his behavior in theological terms. So um, he has been granted through a lineage and through a spiritual transmission the authority to behave as he does. And that allows him in his mind and in his actions to be justified in whatever he does. And that means as, you know, just the broadest example of, is if, if you have a conflict or if you feel hurt or you feel any kind of um, issue with his behavior, how it relates to you, then it's easily translatable as something that you are at fault for. And that is something that we see across all domestic violence relationships is like, you, you are completely to blame for how the perpetrator is behaving. Um, so yeah, there's the, char there's the charisma, which is just a really powerful personality trait. Then there's the divine narrative of justification, which, which means as a devotee, you learn to, you, you learn to adjust your thinking to believe that the one who speaks that this personal, that this leader is his behavior and his, his, his relationships, the way he operates in all the different modes are divinely inspired and therefore always right. And that was my experience with my, in my relationship with the person here locally. That'll, that's good for now. <laughs> Thank you, T. I appreciate that. So I'll follow that. Um, as far as leader goes, uh, I first wanted to say I thank you for, for having me and for being here and that this was really um, an evolution that I I want to have. A, I personally want to thank the Women's Center for. Um, it seems very appropriate. I entered this wanting just to support Todd uh, because we were part of the same um, course of environment, high demand group. Uh, I was in this group uh, locally for 15 years. Um, and I first entered just wanting to act as a support and thinking, um, you know, I could provide some questions and now am a panelist <laughs> uh, kind of claiming my own experience. And so for me, uh, this is my, the first time I've publicly done that in a way. I've, I've posted my, some of my experience on Facebook just to my friends, but this is very much a different thing. And so I thank you for the safety of that um, and for being able to do that. And, and it feels very vulnerable to me and I'm very appreciative. Uh, and so when talking about um, a leader, I have often thought uh, that, you know, what made me um, submit, what made me give over my um, autonomy to some extent, my decision-making. And I think to some degree, we know from research with cults that um, smart, empowered people join cults. You don't have to have a, a history of abuse or anything like that. But for me personally, I did come from an environment where um, I was not allowed to say no to authority figures. Um, that was something that was taught to me at a young age. And also um, at every turn, specifically male authority figures, uh, were given precedent. And so I think that in this, in our culture in general, and not to say, you know, we do have women gurus and we can exist across the spectrum there, but we are taught early on to, um, to, I, I don't know the right word, but just, um, to submit really to, um, men in power that say things authoritatively. And so that was, th there was an environment there in which that was happening um, that was already set up. And I think um, was really powerful. Thanks.
I want to say thank you as well for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, I've known Elizabeth for a long time and I'm, it's an honor to be on a panel with you and, and you as well, T. Um, so what we see a lot, what I see a lot in the families that I work with is um, the, the abuser in the family doesn't necessarily, they don't start by being overly abusive. They start with kindness and they start with, with love bombing and they start with starting to push boundaries a little bit um, to sort of wear away at that. And, and it, and like Elizabeth said, it could be, it could be anyone. It doesn't mean you have, you know, it, having a specific background does not necessarily make a person more likely to end up in a coercive or manipulated relationship. Um, and with the families that I see, having that charismatic person, it is hard to separate yourself from that. Uh, even children who've been terribly abused, they still love the parent that has hurt them so badly. And there's a complicated relationship that's very hard to separate yourself from. Thank you for those thoughtful and just thank you for those thoughtful responses. And I appreciate that. Again, thank you for being here. Um, I want to get into um, the second characteristic that's often referred to um, as thought reform. So this is a type of programming or reprogramming of the mind, more simply known as mind control. Um, I think a lot of people have, have heard of mind control, but um, it's also known as thought reform. So um, this time, let's start with Elizabeth and then go to Rose and finally T um, with this next question. So my next question for Elizabeth is, can you recount your experiences with, with mind control or thought reform, this programming or this reprogramming? Yes. So this is interesting because there's not generally a, for me and, and of course that's all just sharing my experience i don't remember any kind of one particular moment where everything shifted and i think that that's how it works that there's a recipe with all of these elements that are present um and uh a lot of elements um at work and so Definitely love bombing is real. So when you enter the environment uh, for me, um, you initially feel safe and you feel like, you know, your guard can be let down and that maybe this is a place that you belong, right? Um, but there's all these little things in place. And I think um, this summer I read um, Amanda, I'm gonna say her last name, maybe incorrect, Montel, Montel. Um, she wrote a book called Cultish, talking about the language of cults. And I really believe one of the, her, the premises from the book is, which really rang true for me, was it starts with language and language reforms the thought. And that, and it's all the, it's on, and all of these little things, um, you know, that there's a whole, there's a system set up um, that is, that it's all, that the control is already present in and you're entering. Um, but little things like, um, you know, at first you, the thought terminating the cliches. So things that are said in the group that just shut down um, discussion, shut down thoughts. Uh, I have a whole list of these that I could share, but I won't go into all of them. We actually had a lot of fun on um, some ex-members kind of going through some of these things. Some of them are related um, to religious terms that just basically were like, translate to like God willing, but it's like, was definitely a, when you knew not to kind of push it any further because it was like, oh, well, I guess I can't really ask that question. Um, there was a lot of talk about ego, you know, so any number of things that were said that just was a sentence that was like, you know, that's your ego talking. And so you knew to, to shut it down, you know, it wasn't a good time to ask the questions, not to be critical. Um, other things, avoidance is suffering, 
um, this idea, it's, it's interesting too, because as you talk about these, a lot of them are great concepts. A lot of them, you know, they seem like good things, but they get used against you, against kind of pushing against the grain or having questions. Um, you know, if your mind is bringing up a little bit of a like, wait, is that right? Um, you're only allowed kind of, um, you know, at first I wanted to ask questions and I might have asked some, but then I kind of became aware that if you're too critical, you get chastised in front of everybody and that's not fun, you know, but it, this builds, it's a very slow build. And so, um, you know, a lot of thought terminating cliches that just become part of the whole thing. When I first joined to, there was this saying about like, die before you die, which meant like, you know, the ego dies and you have to kill it in order to kind of like, you know, to find your true self. Um, a lot of talking of surrender, surrendering the ego. Um, so I think that language is the first, the first kind of step to mind control. Uh, and it was for me, for sure. And, that, and even, in, even in saying that somebody is a guru, right? Like we, we, we live in this system that's like, you know, you're, you trust teachers, they have authority. And so possibly it seems kind of natural if you're trying to evolve spiritually that you would have a teacher, right? Um, and so another way I think uh, with mind control is the surroundings uh, that, um, that are provided, like everything that, that other people around you are doing. Um, like this also starts very small. And then before you know it, you've changed everything about how you're dressing, what you're saying, what you're doing. Um, you know, small things like, um, you know, not being like first, I remember one of the first things I was told, oh, you know, somebody kind of quietly when I wore shorts one night to a meeting, uh, you know, just out of respect, we dress modestly and don't show the knees. And then the next thing, oh, you don't point your feet at the teacher. And the next thing, oh, you don't turn your back to the teacher. These things are all like, they're very little, but before you know it, you have a hundred different ones and you are, everything is controlled by that. Um, and so language, surroundings, and then experiences. I think that it's very important to, um, to think about things that you're doing. And, and I'm talking again, just about this experience, my experience in a cult. Um, when you're chanting, when you're singing, when you are doing these kind of group activities that you know I now know have a physiological effect, you know that that bring it can bring a sense of calm, can let a guard down. Um, and I think I think that is that lends to that um, you know feeling of safety, and so you're kind of just more apt to conform. And then before you know it, you feel like the need to conform. Um, I think also another thing that happens is slowly this builds up to where eventually with, when talking about mind control, um, you know, I was just going as a spectator at first and then I became part of the group. And then, the, yeah, then there was a turn that came where I was defending the group. And, and I think all of those are kind of just, there's a progression. Um, and that was kind of when, you know, you were fully in it because even though there's dissonance, even though there's things that you don't agree with, you end up in these conversations defending the very thing that you don't, you know, you might know, you might have an inkling, you know, but, there, but there's also real love, real relationships. Like you feel, if you feel loved and you feel a, a certain kind of um, commitment to something or someone you know, you're apt to kind of defend that. And I think that that's all part of the mind control mechanism. Thank you. That was very thoughtful, especially the part about language, as well as um, looking at the way that you dress and your, your body language and the, all the little things that add up and kind of snowball over time. Yeah. I, I wanted to say, if somebody had given me that as a list, of things that I would have to do, right? The first couple nights I showed up, I would have ran, you know? It's, it just is that slow, 
progression. Yeah. Thank you. Other responses? It, when we talk about um, like abusive relationships, we say, well, if somebody you know punched you on the first date, you wouldn't go out with them again. Um, but if they, you know, if they started to build that slowly, where they started to, you know, criticize the way you dressed or the way you talked or how you spent money or things like that, uh, eventually, and the, they started to push the boundaries and move the hurdles in terms of what was acceptable, breaking down your, your natural barriers. Um, it, 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 it's one of those things that takes, it takes time and you don't know it's happening until you're right in the thick of it. And like Elizabeth said, at that point you are, this is what you know, and this is what is true in this moment. And you feel defensive of it. And one of the things that uh, we can do as part of a community is not to go immediately immediately attack um it to be supportive of folks who are being manipulated and dealing with coercive control to be open to them to listen is one of the ways that we're able to sort of let them know that it's not them in this group or them in this abusive person against the world um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> first of all, let me just own the humanness of the fact that I thought I was sending private messages, but instead everybody got them. So, you know, <laughs> I just want to, I'm trying to relax the situation a little bit, um, by being a person. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, Yanya said something really awesome. Okay. It's so great that Yanya Lalich, you know, I don't want to fan girl too much, but you know, she's, she's, she's chiming in here, which is great. She says, I know everyone uses the term mind control, but I'd like to add that it isn't really a scientific term and comes off as something mechanical. In fact, the indoctrination is a process that leads to re-socialization of the person. I think I'll spend the rest of my life trying to understand how that happened. So in, in, my, in my graduate studies and my performances that I'm, pardon me, trying to develop, um, just trying to depict this experience is so difficult. And I think I will, I think I will spend a lot of time trying to unpack how I came, became where I did, you know, how, uh, how it all happened. Um, and uh, I just know where it led. So the, I feel like the purpose of the socialization, re-socialization is to control you so that you end up, like I said before, blaming, I end up blaming myself for everything. And that is the way you stay under a person's control. And in this case, it was justified, like we said before, like by the divine right of the person. So that's part of the narrative that over time I end up, you know, I don't have anger. I mean, somewhere in me, I'm feeling conflicted and angry, but my brain learns to not let myself feel those things. And if I do feel them, then somehow what the re-socialization is, is I, I, I rewire my brain so that I am always at fault or I, I am always responsible for whatever feeling that I have or whatever conflict that I feel or whatever failure I, you know, enact. Um, and I'm too fresh out. I've only been out a year and a half. Um, and to me, that means that um, I'm still pretty fresh. Let me say it this way. People who have been out for a long time still have to re- enact or, or, or they're spending a lot of time going back and figuring stuff out. Like for me, I feel like I'm really fresh, just like, I don't understand <laughs> what happened. I'm just trying to talk it out and say things and 
for me, it just fe feels really, really good to just say a thing and have, you know, Elizabeth or some people go like, oh my God, yeah. You know, um, because in the group, you're completely isolated from yourself, but also from the people around you because it's set up so that you can't, I mean, it has to, for it to function, you can't turn, like when Elizabeth and I were in the group together, I couldn't turn to her and go like, wasn't that weird? Uh, was that screwed up to you? And have her go like, yeah, like, what the hell? Let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, like we, you can't connect with yourself or with each other. And that's also part of um, the process of how you learn to talk your, from, from the leadership, you learn to talk yourself out of what you're feeling and thinking. And it shuts off your critical thinking. So all that to say sort of like, also at the same time saying if my if my words tonight don't always make logical sense <laughs> that's the reason <laughs> i'm still working it out <laughs> thank you that makes sense thank you so much and i want to note on here that um yanya is actually um on tonight and, and listening in the chat and so thank you for, for being here um yanya and um, she said something um, in the chat that I thought was worth noting, just in case you're listening on the phone and, and you can't see the chat. I wanted to note something that she said. She said, I, I know everyone uses the term mind control, but I'd like to add that isn't really a scientific term and comes off as something mechanical. In fact, the indoctrination is a process that leads to socialization of the person with a new worldview and a new moral system like um, Elizabeth was talking about with um, the language and the, you know, the new ways of dress and Rose um, you know, linked back to, and you as well to you all linked back to that. So I just wanted to, um, to bring that point of clarification that, that Yanya had in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, so let's get to the, the third main characteristic that sociologists used to classify um, cult-like behavior or, or cult-like groups is their exploitative nature. To exploit someone, the leader often benefits from his fi followers financially <clears throat> and psychologically or coerces and manipulates them into sexual acts. Often members are taught to put their own needs or family's needs aside so they can better serve the needs of the manipulative manipulative leader. Um, this time, let's start with Rose. Um, Rose, can you speak to that from a professional point of view? And then um, we'll cycle back through T and Elizabeth. And just um, if, if Rose, if you could give us your professional knowledge of um, coercion and exploitation. Absolutely. There's so often there's a feeling that gets built up um, that you can't, you have to do what the person in charge or the abuser or the leader is, wants any, any whim, because there is that fear of what will happen if you don't, even if it's, you know, something as simple as like, oh, well, who's going to get up and refill the glass of water or something, you know, that, in a, a normal family or group setting would be, oh, just another social thing, but there's a, a tension that's underlying that leads to that, that kind of exploitation of, oh, we all wanna make sure that this person is appeased. We wanna make sure that we are in their good graces. Um, and, and that can also lead to following them to things that we wouldn't necessarily have chosen to do um, outside of the circumstance. And, and it's it particularly with, with children, they will, you know, they want that love and they want that affection and they want that acceptance. That's something that, that children need. That's what we need when we grow up. We, we need to feel like we've got that attachment to the adults around us that we can be safe but when we're, we don't when, but when we don't feel safe when we feel like there's a chance that we'll be rejected like that uh and we have to fight 
to be loved, to be accepted, to be, you know, a part of something, uh, that continues to sort of break down your sense of self. Thank you, Rose. Is it my turn? Yes. Yeah, this, this, this is, that word exploitation, that really, that's a, that's an intense word. Um, I mean, I think I can give a lot of examples, but uh, in this group, I, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours upon hours of free labor, um, a, a term that I've lear learned since I left the, the, the group is labor trafficking. And that means, um, you know, really an environment that coerces you, pushes you to give and give and give. And we did, we volunteered. I mean, I, I had a full-time job and, you know, a, another half-time job on top of that, of just giving to the community and, um, you know, working at the, working at the farm. And, uh, at one point, giving away with a family half of my income immediately back to the group in the form of renting from the group. So paying rent to the group and then tithing and then feeling always uh, pushed to give more. There's no limit. There's no limit to what you must give. And then what I gave in terms of my career and my critical thinking. So I was in the middle of a PhD program when I joined the group of my own free will, you know? And um, so I also gave away my career and worked for um, I mean, I just never would ask for anything. And uh, I just, my goal was to be a devoted person. So, you know, that just means that I was set up to time, energy, personal uh, uh, thought, uh, critical thinking, all of it was given. And that's where the group exploits the things that we hold most dear and I was always wired to just give as much as I possibly could. And that that's one of those areas of like huge grief and anger that I feel like, oh my God. Cause for me, I don't think I said this, but I was in for 23 years. So now I'm getting, now I'm going to back to graduate school. I was 29 and now I'm 53. So it's like all of my thirties and all of my forties were given to something that um, I hoped would give results. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very intense structure. Thank you, T. That um, you brought up some wonderful points about sense of of self and um, yeah, you know, how they exploited you know the exploits of your your sense of self as well. I think that's a, a very important point to note. So thank you for bringing that up. And and Yanya is agreeing in the in the chat saying. Um, attacking one's sense of self is the main technique used in cult. So, so thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. And thank you, Yanya, for your, your comments. Okay, Elizabeth, responses. Wow, um, there's so many places to go and we can't get it all in. I just wanna say um, the sense of self is, is a very true, real thing. Uh, I was in my 20s when I entered. I was 15, uh, 15 in for 15 years. Um, had backed away around the last five years or so, but still very much intertwined uh, in my life. Um, I was told that I had that that kind of um, changing of the self and making yourself wrong at every turn. I was told that I had anger issues. So of course, anytime that I had any issue with anything, immediately I tried to squelch any and all anger. Um, I had been out for about eight, I'd been out for eight years when Todd made his first video. I think this is important to share and I would want to get to that. The, um, it, it's all connected really. But when Todd made that first video, um, you know, I had been out for eight years, but this is, there was a pattern when people leave. I, of course, had had some conversations with other ex-members, um, and other people that I trusted. And that was, you know, trying to reconnect, um, 
communities. I had, I realized that I had dropped out. Like I had friends that had moved to other places and had like dinner parties and things like on the regular, you know, had, had surrounded themselves and built, uh, you know, relationships. And, um, I felt in many ways of starting from scratch. I had, ha I went through some therapy when I first left, cause I knew, you know, something happened. It was messed up. There was a lot of things, a lot of tur turmoil in my life at that time. But I stayed in the town, and I think this is important to note because in Carbondale, it's a small town, and, and this is a somewhat powerful group uh, because they have a lot, there's money behind it. And I felt that I couldn't really speak out because I, at the time, was just newly a single mom. Um, I was financially dependent on certain aspects and things, and I kept quiet. You know, I, I, I had critiques but I kept it to myself or, to, or just with trusted others and ex-members. And um, so eight years passed and I thought that's just the way things are gonna be. The first video that Todd made, I was in complete like what I, and I almost immediately, I don't know why this was my response, but I sought out another counselor, a trauma-informed um, counselor. And um, I knew for some reason that if you were gonna keep speaking, I was gonna need more help. <laughs> I was gonna need to kind of just put some things together and have somebody that I needed, could talk with and process that with. And it's been a game changer for me. And so I really wanna thank Todd because what you did is you started a ripple. And I think what we're acknowledging now is a lot of people in town have had questions, have had like, um, you know, thoughts or had no, have known people that have been hurt. And um, you started a ripple with people talking and being able to talk. And we know now that the transgressions were, they exist on, um, that a lot of bad things happen. And it's all kind of wrapped up in, you know, we'll look at the good work that we're doing. That's how that, that operates. But, and I think that this will be coming out soon, but like, you know, um, there were transgressions and now we know that there's patterns of behavior, um, patterns of predatory behavior that aren't, you know, that um, we didn't know about at the time. And we don't know what the bottom is yet. Um, and so I just wanna thank you because, you know, I. I I think it's just important to have it open, to have it out and to have people be, have a place that they can feel safe and talk about it. And so thank you to Todd for starting that. Um, definitely gave a lot of my time and, on, and money as well, um, you know, um, gladly and willingly at the time. Um, but also I, and this is where I don't want to live in regret, but I was in my 20s and had like a plan that did not involve staying in Carbondale for this long. I love this place, but I, I felt like I was going other places. And it was by and large, um, you know, the cult and the relationship that kind of was intertwined in this cult that kept me. I was somehow led to believe that my interests and my dreams were important to this person, to the leader, to the group, and that somehow th everything would happen through that. And now I've really come to realize that was not the case at all. Um, you know, and there's some part of me that can't help but feel behind from that a little. And some of the redeeming quality is that at least we exist here, at least this is happening. At least now I can um, share what I learned and hopefully, it's my hope that um, other people, that we get to a point where enough people know that um, don't also have that same experience happen to them or a similar one. Thank you for that. That was extremely powerful, Elizabeth. Um, I just wanna thank, say thank you again for being here this evening and DUT as well, and, and Rose, of course. Um, you mentioned um, patterns or predatory patterns of behavior rather. So speaking to that, I think it's time that we, we discuss 
how do charismatic leaders indoctrinate? How do groups you utilize that, that charismatic control? How do they manipulate members or whole groups to think and feel and utilize these patterns over and over? So charismatic leaders utilize patterns of um, social psychology and linguistics, some of those um, which you've, you've discussed already um, a bit about the linguistic nature of certain turns of phrase that would shut a conversation down and or, um, you know, sometimes nonverbal or um, verbal communicators of, of communic you know, just some type of communication, like you don't show your feet, the bottom of your feet to, a, to the leader or you dress a certain way. So when we're thinking about that, um, social psychologists who, who study groups, group behavior and, and cult-like groups have narrowed leaders and groups who utilize coercive control down to seven elements that make someone more susceptible to being manipulated into coercion. Um, during this next portion of the discussion, I'll just put um, questions out to the group and allow panelists to answer questions as the answers come to them. We'll just kind of get into a natural state of, of flow as, so if you have something to say, we'll just, you know, it'll be, you know, as, as you see fit. So the first element of control is um, finding someone at a crossroads or in an already vulnerable state. When people are already doubting themselves, they're easier to control, manipulate, or to indoctrinate. Uh, panelists, do you agree or could you speak to your own professional or, or personal knowledge of this indoctrination process? I was waiting. Okay. Um, I think the crossroads is is very um, is very true. And I, as I've thought back now to patterns um, and thinking of, because it is part of the thing that is um, saying like, oh, we're here for you. You know, when you find yourself in a vulnerable position in a transition in life. Um, and that definitely was the case with me when I first showed up. Um, I had moved back to Carbondale for a little bit. I was, I had gone through some personal things um, and very much was kind of in a starting space, you know, had, had had some troubles basically. And so, um, but I've also seen this in the group um, a lot. Uh, where, you know, we reach out in, at our most vulnerable stages, you look for help. And if that's a group where you feel safe and, you know, they have wonderful food and there's some music and everybody loves you and you're welcome anytime. Um, it's not surprising, but I definitely, my own personal experience was yeah, I was at a crossroads. It was brought up in the chat that college towns are notorious for this kind of thing. And I, re I remember getting advice from a, one of my teachers in high school saying, wherever there's free food, go, because <laughs> you may not always have really good food that's available to you. Um, and that, you know, when you're, when you're in a, a space that is as transitional as a college town and the, uh, the rental market isn't great and you don't necessarily know who your friends are or who to trust yet, it can be really, it can be hard to resist um, even if you're, you know, uh, even if you're, you know, like in the middle of a PhD like T was, if you're, you know, even if you have 
all of your smarts and your wits and you know sense of who you are as a person if there's something going on that's where you're still a little where there's something you're unsure of that is when people can can step in and use that coercive control um i i i guess i'm not gonna talk personally here just because what's What's interesting to me is that um, I definitely was susceptible. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten so sucked in. But but uh, I'm not sure there's a set of characteristics. I mean, we had a we had a great conversation with Elizabeth and some friends earlier this week, and you know, uh, several people who encountered the group really early on in their living in Carbondale. Excuse me. And believe me, more people didn't join the group than joined the group. So there's a lot of stories of people who encountered the guru or something about the group and they were immediately like, um, no, <laughs> you know, because for whatever reason, you know, the thing in them that senses danger and trust themselves was not broken. They just, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you can explain that, you know, it's, it's just some people encountered the group and went, this is not for me. And this is weird, you know. Um, others were like, "Oh my God, love," you know. So I don't know how to explain that, but um, I I am starting to develop to develop a theory though about Carbondale itself, which is that, and I think this is really significant because one of the things that I have I have run into I'm not kidding a hundred times since I left the group or since I started speaking out is the same narrative of people in Carbondale going like, "Yeah, I thought." something felt weird or or like it's like the whole town was vulnerable so you know you think if, if this was some economically thriving you know metropolitan you know i don't know coolness um then someone would have moved into town and they might have someone like the town might have gone like um we don't need you here no <laughs> but the town was needy and vulnerable you know, so so they chose perfectly and he chose perfectly to come in here to this town that needed stuff and set up businesses that were like exciting. And, you know, so you have you have lots of folks who were like 20, you know, 20 year customers of the businesses going like, you know, something was weird. I never trusted it really because I liked going there. You know, or like, so, so there's this sense in, and then, and then he establishes, you know, relationships with um, the government and with um, law enforcement and is always empowered and never questioned despite the rumors or just, you know, and it's taken this, it's taken somebody at the university recently was like, you know, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to get too much detail, but people people say like well we need evidence and i'm thinking like it took 25 years to tell this story it took 25 years for people to piece together all the different parts and for for it to be spoken publicly so the the level of shame blame you know uh dissociation uh separation that happens and the, the level of violence and trauma that it takes to create that level of fear. So Elizabeth said, like, you know, it's like years later, it's still scary to speak. You know, there's a reason that it took this long for this meeting to happen. Years. And that's where I go like, whoa, OK, that's that's like a gaslit town. And that's a manipulated town, not just the people in the group. All the hundreds of people in Carbondale who were like, this is weird. Is this weird? but not being able to piece it together, you know? I don't even remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, you're doing wonderfully. I'd like to just jump in there a little bit and say, you know, just because you didn't get that initial feeling of like, ooh, this is weird. We all have different things that set us off. We all have our different life experiences that lead us to be more suspicious of, you know, different characteristics in people. So there's a reason that 
you know, that it worked, that certain people work on some certain people and not on others. And I absolutely don't want you to blame yourself for not having that specific instinct with this specific person in this specific group. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our panelists again for just your time and and thank you for sharing your experiences. I mean, I think people here are learning a lot. There's a lot of wonderfully um, put anecdotes and or um, just experiences in the comment section, just to let you know that it's everything's very supportive as of right now. So we're, we're thankful to our, our viewers at home. So thank you for that. Um, just a second, something's going on with my Zoom, of course. <laughs> There we go. I could respond to something Todd made me think you <laughs> help me think about a little bit. Um, that uh, that goes back to the crossroads as well. And like we want community in our lives. Like we see connection. It's just it's human, right? And so um, when you're going through a hard time and somebody helps lift you up, that's like, and I do think that there's healthy spiritual community, you know, that does exist somewhere where you're like, not like, you know, chastised about not being somewhere or, you know, that you can just exist and support people. That's like what you're supposed to do. But there was an element in this situation for me that was like a, we owe you and, you know, you owe us in a way right now. Um, it's almost like a bond. And what happened, and I, I did this myself and I saw this time and time again is, so the crossroads could happen, you know, everybody has a crisis and, um, and not, not that everybody that came to the group was coming straight, straight from a crisis, but it did happen. Um, and there were systems set up where it becomes a narrative that is encouraged, where that is reinforced continually, that is, you saved me, this saved me. I was so broken and now this, and like every, um, you know, there was a weekly meeting, um, a check-in with people who were supposed to be vulnerable and nine times out of 10, when people spoke, it's almost like it's this unspoken rule that at the end you would take a turn on just, but how grateful and lucky you, it was like you could, it was almost like you were allowed to speak about a problem possibly or something that you're struggling with. But at the end, there's always this turn to how grateful you are that, you know, this exists and how um, it just becomes this, it, it gives it more power almost that, um, you know, that there's this, that this saved you in a way. Thank you. And that, and that inspires, that's, that's an enormously powerfully manipulative stance in the sense that like, so what happens is that if you ever don't behave in some correct way, which would be, you know, 100% generosity, 100%, you know, in his direction, the way that he wants, that is swung as ungrateful. So it's like, it's like, how would you, that, that means, you know, you, why would you do that to him? So he becomes the victim of a person's faults. So, you know, if, if we do something wrong, it's because, yeah, it's ingratitude, which is based on the sense of owing. So, you know, we're, we, are, we are indebted to him for his, you know, benevolent divine generosity without which we would be lost. Yes. Other thoughts before we, if are we ready to move on or are there other thoughts? Just from Todd's, with what Todd just shared, and he's shared some of this before, um, but definitely this, something that would happen like when people leave and the shame around that, that you, you would, um, everybody would be talked about, like the, one of the phrases where they blew out. So they like just couldn't handle it. Um, all kinds of things that were said, even in slight really about people that didn't agree, didn't believe, 
um, you know, that would come and then go and all kind of part of that cycle of, you know, control and manipulation. And I just want to mention um, that you're talking about like when things would, when you would do wrong, it would be a slight against against the, the leader. There's a, uh, a tactic called DARVO and that stands for deny, mm -hmm. attack and reverse victim and offender mm -hmm. that um, is frequently used in abusive situations to make it, oh, this didn't happen. And if it did happen, it wasn't the way that you saw, you thought it happened. And in fact, you did it to me. So um, that, uh, that is a whole phenomenon that uh, that has been studied and is very, I mean, it's very effective. Completely. <laughs> and I try not to think too much about, you know, there's, a, there's an effect from this um, in our community, right? And thinking about some of the responses and, you know, that there is, and, and Todd has also said this a lot, but there really can, what doesn't exist is the ability to actually look critically at yourself and the actions that like, it couldn't actually possibly be something is wrong with these group dynamics or that there is behavior that was just wrong, you know, that that's like so far out of the question. And um, yeah, it's, it kind of proves the point in a way, it proves the imbalance. Yeah, the, the premise of this coercive group is that the leader is infallible. And, and for, so when, you know, after, if somebody leaves after two decades um, and somebody wants to, somebody, some, some of the membership wants to reflect like, hey, maybe there was something that we could have done differently. No, that is not allowed as a line of questioning because that would mean that the guru would need to compromise his you know, divinely inspired idealistic standards to lessen them to accommodate a particular person's needs. So, I mean, one of the things we've run into this is a Carbondale thing too, is, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, let me be more specific. When, when the group came to Carbondale, it was like, oh, cool, religious diversity. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like, uh, like, yay, you know, we think of ourselves as people who are tolerant. And, um, and a lot of the, you know, the liberals in town were like, well, okay, this is a different way of doing things. It's a different way of operating. And we celebrate that, which is beautiful. You know, we do. Um, and, and one of the things we've had, we've actually taken time to talk with some groups in the last six months or so to explain to them, yes, there's a difference, but also when you really get into how this group is operating, it really is against your value system <laughs> that, that, you know, a particular person's unique personhood is is oppressed um, over the you know submission you know we, we took vows of obedience you know we <clears throat> it's not it's not true that it's just another way of expressing our liberal religion it's it's not it's a uh, um, the the coercion and the, the, the trauma that <laughs> reverberates from that is, it's not part of our happy family of, of diverse ex expression. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing incongruently, but that's what I'm doing. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that I, as someone who was not, you know, who was not a member of the group, but is part of the community I, that narrative, absolutely. Um, because the group is, you know, claims affiliation with a marginalized uh, religion in a very rural area. Um, 
there was a lot of like, oh, okay, we don't want to look, we don't want to look intolerant. Um, that dynamic absolutely was just, yeah, the town bought into it. Yeah. I, um, I think it's important to say, and I, I, I know that I can speak at least for some of the more closer people to me that were at our ex members, that it's like when we're speaking out about this, I want to be real clear that it's not out against the religion at all. A in any way, shape or form, there are some really obviously beautiful things. And, um, and there are some specific kind of roles or titles that are associated with this group that are actually really beautiful things. Um, you know, and so this is really targeted at this system of control, at the manipulation, and at what we have a narcissist leader that I actually personally believe is, is, is um, also a sociopath. Um, I... And so that's that's where that go, that goes for me. And then also wanted to say, when I was in the group, I remember some discussion of, you know, like for a long time um, there was kind of a like we don't want to be in the, in public eye. We don't want no, you can't come and write your dissertation about our that whatever, or um, we don't we're not interested in being featured in this article. Some of that happened. It was very controlled, but there was this. I remember discussions about, you know, people will call this a cult, but um, almost like, well, you know, anything's a cult, right? You know, there was that. And um, I remember this whole discussion about the root of cult is cultivate. And like, that's how, and to like grow and kind of, you know, um, this narrative that would have you, that kind of was looking away at some of the problems. Um, kind of in preparation for possibly being called that. And uh, I think too, I look back and think, you know, when I first entered, it was the 90s and there was a whole nother set of behavior that was acceptable. I think that this, that cert, there's been certain turns that have happened that make this a lot less um, acceptable just in, the gen, in general terms, um, you know, kind of maybe going back to me too, maybe, you know, other things, which by the way, yeah, we won't get into that, but I think that it's just less, um, it's less acceptable. And then we're also in a culture that, um, you know, is wants to kind of bring these things into the light. And, uh, you know, we know there are a lot of people, um, you know, I have friends, I, I was thinking about this where I have roommate, I, I feel somewhat responsible for, for helping people get involved, you know, because there I was defending it and there I was inviting people. And I have people that, um, it's interesting, just recently I reconnected with somebody that left um, that I thought was gonna be a lifelong friend. And there he was again, you know, because he left the group and we could actually, he could actually connect again. And I had a roommate at the time that used to be annoyed at like my chanting or praying or whatever. And that person is still in the group and I haven't had a real conversation with them in years. And, um, you know, I think that's also where to look is like, well, I really love what you said, um, Rose, about it's not necessarily, the reaction can't necessarily be one of anger. I am angry at a lot of things that happen and I can actually own my anger now and it's like a real valid emotion. But um, there's a, so much sadness I have for the people that are still there and they don't even feel it or know it. And I don't wanna be like, oh, I pity them. But like, there's some real messed up stuff happening and um, friends that I loved. And uh, yeah, that's that's not pity. That's empathy. That's compassion. That's that's caring, and that's love to to worry and to want better for people. I 
I, I also know what's at stake though. Cause like, I mean, it, I mean, it, it was not very long ago that I had all that thinking. So I can remember what it was like to defend everything and to have it, you know, so it's like, and I, I, I think about some of those people and I think, God, the stakes are really high. Like when, in other words, when you, when you start to let in that this is not real, your world really, you have to be, you have to be like physically safe in a, in a place where you can let yourself, like, I feel like it, you need some kind of safety. And this is where, I mean, maybe this is where we get a little too soon into like getting out. I mean, the, the process of getting out, it's like, again, you know, Rose and Carly, you, you know, this more, maybe more intimately, but there's some configuration of things that has to happen where you can let yourself, because if you are completely unsafe, you know, to let yourself start to think like really about what's going on, it may not be safe. So I, I, I can I can imagine or I can understand why someone would stay in because first of all, I did it to myself for so long. And second, yeah, your life will fall apart. <laughs> you know, when you start thinking, oh no, this is not what I thought it was. You've got to be ready for everything to fall to pieces. And that's really hard, it's really hard. I think that's a good point that, um, yes, your, your life will fall apart, but some of it will fall back together in unexpected ways too. Oh, it all falls so. amazingly back together and there's a million yeah. reasons to do it. It's just, I guess what I, I just meant to say, like, I get why somebody doesn't. That's what I mean. Yes, I think that's a very empathetic point of view that um, someone with your unique experience would be able to, you know, to frame that. So thank you. Um, so going back to basics, um, the next element of indoctrination or induction into a, um, a group like this, um, sometimes it's known as the soft sell. Um, the term meaning would be members are asked if they are happy with their lives um, because upper echelon of the group or a leader has found the people or a person at a crossroads, like we just talked about, um, all the different ways that people can be in crossroads or the town itself. So that's a that's a wonderful point of view, T, that you know, that Carbondale is is, is a vulnerable place itself. Um, and I loved what Elizabeth had to say about, you know, we've we've come a long way since the 90s of, you know, society has changed and the community has changed somewhat, maybe. So with, with that in mind, this, this whole thing is of the soft cell reminds me a little bit about what Rose and um, all of you shared about love bombing. And so um, when, when people or the group or the leader themselves find people at this crossroads in their lives, <clears throat> excuse me, they know the answer will most likely be um, no or an unsure answer to are you happy with your life? Or, or they're not sure because they don't know what's out there and they're young or they're at a crossroads. So they're like, well, I'm figuring it out. So um, this is a way that they can encourage people or, or groups can encourage new members to keep coming back. Um, is there any experience that you have of, of wanting to leave? So, so this, this point of view that you have of, of wanting to leave, but oh, everything's gonna come crashing down or I'm not sure this is for me. Can you can you speak to the love bombing, or can you speak to the um, to this the soft sell or the love bombing? I think immediately when I go to that, that how um, dependent it becomes on. It doesn't take very long to get intertwined in ways that, before you know it, every aspect of your life is intertwined, and so that's relationships, that's work, that's livelihood to where if you did want, and that's also like commitments that you might feel that you need to follow through on, you know? And so, um, and so it makes it harder to actually get away because, um, you know, you have a family that is intertwined in it. You um, are, with Todd's case and a lot of others, working in some aspect um, from this. And so uh, I think that that's, that's hard. And then 
for me personally, I, um, I didn't really see a lot of the see, and it's also, I don't want to tell other people's stories, but my life was intertwined in a way that, um, almost to get out, everything had to be, I didn't even realize it at the time. I just knew that I needed to leave. Something happened that, um, something happened at the end where I was able to see the leader, like it was obvious that something had happened to me specifically where it was like, wow, you know what I mean? You just lied. I know you lied, even though you're trying to tell me that you didn't. And this was a transgression that I could, I just was so wrong. And it was kind of one of the last steps and I needed to go. And I think at the time I knew it was a cult, but it took me years to kind of unpack. And it took me getting on the other side, looking out, and then also having people try and talk me into, or try and talk about it to me or why I left or what I'm not looking at for me to kind of identify that. Um, I don't think that I did right away. It wasn't like, oh, I'm in a cult. I need to get out. It was like this bad thing happened. I mean, and, and I think everybody's experience is obviously going to be a little bit different. Um, but I had had a personal experience with the leader that just was, I knew was beyond wrong and I needed to go. And that was it. And I did. And, and then from there, there was a lot of unpacking. Um, and it wasn't probably till a while later that I looked back and been like, you know, still while in the town, still while seeing people involved, still while being involved in groups that were having meetings at these places, you know, that I didn't want to go to, that I, ha I completely realized um, what I was dealing with. <laughs> I had a funny memory, which is that I went to a YMCA camp when I was like 11 and they had some kind of silly ceremony where, you know, like the nicest kid from the cabin, from each cabin was like taken out into the woods and they had some kind of initiation. And I, I remember watching that going like, I want to. I want to go out of the woods and have an initiation. Like I, I just wanted to be part, whatever that was in all my different parts of my life, I wanted to be part of it. Like this, the secret thing that went into the woods, like the inner circle, can I, yes, that's, that's what I want, you know, for whatever weird reason. So, so this was perfect for that, for me. It was like a little bit of an alternative religion, like, you know, all these smart people. The love bombing was, um, the soft sell is such an interesting thing because he he does that perfectly where he did there there is you know we were able to deny for years that we recruited because there was never the hard sell it was never like oh you should be this and we like like some maybe maybe some fundamentalist groups will be like christianity is right is is the right way and you will burn in hell like we were sort of like no we accept all the people and like we accept all the religions and our way is not the right way like we're or or there are many paths that's the, that's perfect for the soft sell of sort of like oh I'm so attracted to this because they're they're not like exclusivist you know you know later you realize that we thought because we were so open minded that we were better than everybody else you know <laughs> um, but the, the for me the love bombing was immediate I was given a plane ticket to Germany um, gifted it I was taken and then and then for someone like me it's like I was given a spiritual name. I was initiated in a special ceremony. Um, all these things were like, oh, I fit, or I'm, I, they love me, like I'm, I'm special. I, I have some kind of spiritual longing, leaning discipline that is unique among human beings and aren't I lucky? And yeah, uh, someone in the chat says, yeah, so I wore, I got, oops. Sorry, <laughs> I wore the ring, you know, I got, we got rings and all these things made me feel like I was part of an elite thing. And that was something that I wanted to be. So it sort of fit with, it fit with the vulnerable things of like, you know, I mean, you can theorize like, well, I, I clearly wasn't feeling like I was enough in myself. Otherwise I wouldn't have been susceptible to that. But, um, oh, love bombing is 
very important part of the of the and 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 the reason it attracts people who are sort of like educated and smart is because we wouldn't fall for something that was like immediately dogmatic in your face. We're like we're the people who don't fall for that because we're not we're not cults. We're not a cult. We're like these smart people who dropped out of a thing because you know the material world is you know it's not fulfilling and now we have decided to give ourselves because we want to make the world better. I mean is there a more you know regal endeavor than that? No. We were giving of ourselves completely fearlessly to make the world better. Thank you. You already touched on the um, the next element, actually. So one of the next elements that we were going to discuss is um, just um, the creation of a new reality. So um, specific clothing, um, a new identity, a new name, um, anything given, a plane ticket, and your old identity, oh, that's back in Carbondale. You'll, you'll come back to Carbondale anew um, and asking um, for you know, anything old to be tossed aside. So I, th I think you really touched on, on that creation of an, a new reality. Any, any other responses to the, re the creation of a new reality? when when you have a reality that's you know that is shifted like that it can continue to be shifted as um as you know the leader or the abuser or the head of the group sees fit as it serves them um so uh that can mean that as soon as you're starting to feel like even once you you feel like you've developed an identity in this new identity you might have that shifted entirely so you've got to start again and when you are constantly living in survival mode when you're constantly on edge when you're constantly wanting to you know do what needs to be done so that you are accepted or you are you are okay you're it, it I could get into the I won't give everybody the lecture about about trauma and how it affects you but you are too physically and emotionally exhausted to be able to push back and to have that like critical thought of like oh I don't want this to be part of my identity like you're just like okay I've got to keep going I've got to keep going I've got to stay alive I've got to keep you know keep my reputation keep going and also that one and a half jobs on top of all of the, you know, the mechanics of what Rose was discussing about um, physically and emotionally, like just the, the realization, like um, Todd was talking about earlier, I'm sorry, T was talking about earlier about just wanting to be able to, to work those, that job, you know, the job to support you and your family plus the tithing and then the, the other job that you're working to, to keep, you know, the, everything going mm -hmm. and to be able and, to, to give, go ahead. Cause service is a really great thing in theory and I believe in it, volunteerism, but this whole selfless service that got tied up within the rhetoric of the group of like, um, you know, there really was that die before you die, like lay everything down, give everything. And it was almost like, it would get to a competition to a certain degree of like, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, look how selfless I am. And I saw people, um, I feel like I saw people almost, and in some case one, I, I know there were not healthy boundaries and there were, there were not, um, you know, boundaries would be scoffed at. They didn't, it's not even really didn't exist. Um, but, you know, being kind of encouraged to ignore what your body is saying, being encouraged to work past being tired, being encouraged to show up anyway, you know, and that this idea that you would want to just, like, I have come to realize that I'm, I, I'm somewhat, even though I have a public kind of job that I do, I'm somewhat introverted 
And I really thrive in being alone for periods of time. And that was never understood. It was never sympathized with. It was never accepted. It was me hiding out, um, you know, all kinds of things that were thrown in that way. And I want to I wanna speak to something that I was just remembering, you know, you're talking about creating this new reality. And so when you took initiation, you know, something that was said was that you would consult him in all matters, you know, that were significant. Um, and you agreed to do that. And that also you wouldn't talk about it, that you wouldn't share. I still to this day sometimes uh, have that in the back of my head that like, oh, I shouldn't be talking about these things because they're secret. And um, another one that I think is really significant is we were also told to um, any time you had a big dream, like, it, you know, when you had a dream, you were supposed to tell him and not anybody else. And so we would be, be in this kind of thing. It was like, oh my gosh, I had this like powerful dream. Like, but you can't, don't, you know, you can't tell the person that you're like, making food with or anything. You needed to wait for the time to tell him. And I think that that's so significant in a way because, um, well, our dreams are significant and he gets to interpret them then, you know, or kind of quell any um, red flags that are coming through them. I know we might be a little bit off topic here, but I just want to um, say, well, uh, also thank you, Yanya, she's, she's leaving. Um, oh my God, so I've had people recently say to me like, are the Sufis homophobic? And I'm like, it's so much deeper than that. And what Elizabeth's talking about, like the fact, the thing about like, um, you cannot have a boundary. I mean, that's really, really deep. And I think it's, it's fundamentally violent is what I've come to see. And, and that makes me think about the, the child that I raised and how, let me, let me just say, it's such a dangerous environment. And one of the things, because of the nature of this webinar, we are not saying names and we're not telling specific stories, but I just want to communicate that um, the stories are way worse than we are speaking out loud right now. And I want people to kind of take that in. And I think it's, it's fundamentally based on this whole idea that a person's particular point of view is not important. And that, that translated also to the children. So um, a, tr a child couldn't go like, no, I don't want to that was not allowed uh, because it wasn't allowed within the adults. Um, and there are, there's, you know, thousands of examples of the leadership and his very inner, inner circle. And by that, I mean, wives um, constantly belittling a person's need to have their own no, let's just call it a no. So, so to be like, mm, that's not right for me. That was not allowed. And so I can't emphasize enough what that fundamental human need being erased, what, what it allows a leader to do. And saying no and pushing back is one of the first things we learn to do as, as young children, as we're figuring out how we interact with other people. It's something that's, you know, it can be frustrating for parents, but is so important. It's so important to be able to, you know, really realize that like no is a full sentence. And when someone says no, that you need to accept that. And being, having that taken away is such a violation. Well said, well summed up. 
I heard a lot of um, of your experiences, and it, it reminded me of the the saying, you know, it's uh, the layman's terms, um, voluntold instead of volunteer. That you know, the violation of boundaries, um, being unable to say no, and and learning very quickly that you will be ridiculed if you'll say no is another type of interpersonal violence. And I, I wanted to point out something that um, that Yanya said earlier about. Let me see it, find it in the comments. Anyways, I wanted to point out um, she is had a bounded choice. Yes, thank you, Rose. I was like, I, and of course I just lost it, but yes, bounded choice in that, you know, that you have to, you know, your boundaries with your identity even are, are blurred and, and crossed to the extreme points of violence. So I, I liked that that turn of phrase because you know my layman's terms were you know voluntold instead of volunteer, but it, of course Yanya packaged it you know with the professional you know professor of sociology that she is with this you know, bounded choice yeah like you're not even in control of your own boundaries. So that's that was an um, important point to um, to get across. So thank you for for summing that up, Rose, and and thank you for your anecdotes. Um, and your, your stories and your points of view, T and, and Elizabeth. So um, uh, another element that we were going, we're gonna discuss, this will be our last element. Um, it, it's getting close to time and I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for comments and questions at the end. We have several wonderful conversations happening in the chat and I wanna make sure that our panelists are um, able to interact with that because it's, it's all, um, I don't want to say it's all positive, but it's all coming from a, a stance where, where they're supporting what our panelists are saying. They're supporting um, in a way that's that's you know recounting stories and and going along with what our panelists are, are discussing. So I want to make sure that our um, our audience that that is in the chat can can also have some input in um, in a respectful way with our with our panelists who are um, kind enough and brave enough to. To recount some of, of what they're discussing tonight. So another element that's um, that is discussed is um, that the relationship that is the most important in your whole world must be with the leader, the leader. So um, that being said, is there uh, something else that anyone wants to add about your your el that to that element? In that relationship with the leader. If not, we can we can move on and we'll go to the next. Um, another element: creating an external enemy is the next stage. And again, this is like you know, different stages can happen throughout. It doesn't have to be. It's not a very linear. Like it can be backwards, forwards, and most stages of of um, abusive and coercive behavior. It's all backwards, forwards. And because of the, the nature of trauma and, and, and the way it, it uh, you know, it, it touches up, you know, the, the frontal lobe of our brain and it, the way our bodies react, it, it's hard to remember, you know, which, what happens in a linear fashion. So this creating of an external enemy, um, I want to discuss, it's um, a stage noted, by the way, in which leaders will tell you how evil the outside world is compared to the safety of the group. This gets back to the, the pushing of boundaries that you were discussing earlier. People at the stage often um, report beginning to doubt their own sense of judgment, reasoning, um, and reasoning because they're told by everyone around them that's also under this coercive control and boundaries who are also being pushed. Um, they're, they're being told, or, you know, and, and some people truly believe this, um, that everyone around them is being tainted by the outside world. So again, not being able to trust your own point of view, as you discussed earlier, this creates that cognitive dissonance with the psyche, um, questioning your judgment and your ability to reason. Um, and usually people choose to return to the safety of the group or the leader. Um, in domestic violence and in interpersonal violence, we know that seven is the average it's not a number you know that's that's every single person sometimes it's 10 i have a colleague who talks about you know when they they speak out about it took her 10 times to, to leave a group some people you know seven is the average talking about leaving and this, this whole you know the whole society is an external enemy 
are there any things or anything that you, you wish to impart on the group? Any, any thoughts of wisdom from your experience that you want to impart on the group? Well, that it was definitely there. Um, I think I had heard, a, I saw a um, comment from Kurt talking about this kind of apocalyptic narrative that existed. And I'm remembering when um, we had been kind of allowed to move to go to Chicago for a little while. And after 9-11 um, happened, uh, it was, we had this meeting that, um, you know, basically we, we wouldn't want to be in Chicago for what's going to be going down you know, kind of like this fear uh, that, you know, we needed to kind of come back to safety. And there was a lot of other things, um, but definitely an us and them uh, creation. And even, even when people, um, you know, like, you know, you would go and visit family and, and things like that, it would just be this, you know, they didn't know, right? Like the, the, the other people in your life, just didn't have kind of the answer to a certain extent, um, but definitely us and them and uh, that apocalyptic kind of narrative. And I do agree that it's a good thing to like create food and be self-sufficient and do a DIY. But yes, that that would, you know, we would need this as our, as insurance in a way. And to go back to the first point about the um, leader, you know, you had shared that characteristic right before it just made me think about this it's odd really you know you'd walk in somewhere and somebody had like an altar to somebody living like a picture of a living of of him the leader on it you know um literally an altar and this narrative that you know a lot since you did not necessarily at first I'll never put somebody in between me and my relationship with the divine again but um this narrative that like if you didn't really know at least you could like kind of fake it in a way for a person so that you would treat a person almost you know that they were um like God so that it was almost practice for you know how your relationship with God would be Um, yeah, Carly, I'd, it's not like I had nothing to say about the last one, but I think my, I think my brain is kind of like, bleh, like, but, it, um, it's just totally understandable. Like, totally so understandable. It's, it's just really intense to talk about this. Um, but, uh, the, the first thing I have to say about the, you know, the, the us against them thing is I just want to tell everyone that. I am personally responsible for all the evil in the world now. <laughs> so like someone leaves the group and like, I mean, you know, they just become the bad person. And because I was so public, like I've just heard a lot of like second, third hand things about like, I heard, you know, I heard T did blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, I'm just like, literally all I'm doing is telling my experience. But I, Or that you're crazy like I was. Yeah, yeah we're all crazy. We're... You know, I mean, just there's all these ways of disparaging the people on the outside. And now that there's a lot of there's a lot of community activism in different ways, decisions or, you know, what WSIU did and all these different things are happening. All those are somehow my conspiracy. Like it, it, it can't it can't actually be an organic response to a real thing. It's got to be some evil person masterminding it. So that's the evil here. But the other thing I wanted to say was, um, and this is an important story to me, when I came into the group, I identified as gay, not identified, I was gay. <laughs> and um, and, and I, I still was while I was in the group, but I married a woman and had this whole relationship. And then part of my coming back out of the group was identifying as saying like, oh, I'm gay. You know, like there was this whole cognitive dissonance. But about five years ago, because we're supposed to seek the gurus, the guru in quotes, we're supposed to seek his guidance with all important things. And as terrifying as that was, because I was always bullied and humiliated by him, every once in a while, I would like do what I was supposed to do. And I would go to him and I would say, and I said, hey, my, 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 you know, my relationship, my marriage, which is a heterosexual marriage, 
my, my marriage is hard. Am I just gay? Like I asked him that directly to his face. And he said to me, well, do you really expect to find someone in this group living your lifestyle who's also a man that you can be in, re in relationship with? So the assumption was that all my answers were only there. And that because I couldn't find that, there wasn't gonna be another gay guy who also wanted to do that, then I should just, and so, so I left that relation, I left that conversation going like, I guess I'll just stay married then. It was like, you know, and, and it never, so in other words, in that system, it would never have occurred to him to be like, uh, you're gay, go out and do that thing. Go, go be yourself, I liberate you. No, this is the answer for all people. So you have to fit yourself to that. So that, that in itself is an us against them thing. It's like, no, this, like if you're not in here doing this, then somehow you are missing a piece. That us against them dynamic. I mean, I mentioned everyone who is on this call right now can understand a little bit of what that's like of having that that feeling of oh you know bonding over a common enemy um it's a very human experience and in the work that i do with uh families getting out of domestic violence situations and with children we never tell the kids that their abuser was a terrible person we never tell the person, the parent who's escaping or the partner who's escaping that, uh, you know, oh, well, they were just terrible. Why would you, you know, why would you be with them? Because there's that feeling then of like, oh, I have to defend this person who was so important to me, even if they were so bad to me. And I'll circle back around to sort of what I said towards the beginning of this, that being an open and kind and compassionate space, being a, a soft landing space can make, is so much more helpful to getting people out of abusive situations and you know coercive situations than being like, oh, well, that group is a cult and they're weird and everything's weird and I don't want anything to do with that so you know being there even if there's a part of your mind it's like oh this feels really weird like still being like oh you're I can connect to this human experience that you are having and I want you to be able to I, I don't want to dismiss your worries and I don't want to dismiss the things that are that feel positive about this as well I think that's very important, Rose. And I think um, earlier you you touched on a point that was Darvo that that relates to the seventh element, the serving the needs of a sociopath or a narcissistic or a person or somebody who has narcissistic fleas, as they're called, or, or tendencies. So, um, can you talk about Darvo again and that tactic that's often used against survivors and or against the whole world or community or society at large? What's that What's that Darvo again? Can you talk about that? Deny? Yeah, deny. Um, oh, good heavens. I've got to look it up because I can't remember all the- I know it's okay. deny, attack, reverse, and I forget the V yeah. every time. <laughs> deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. So it swaps those roles. Um, and someone who is, you know, who does have narcissistic tendencies or the antisocial tendencies is very good at making themselves the victim. And even when it means that the entire world is, you know, is against them, if, even if it means that, you know, one person is creating all the evil in the world, you know, because they went against them. Um, and one of the things I, I try to bring up when I talk about, about abuse is uh, when someone is grooming their victim, they don't just groom their victim. They groom their whole family, their community. They, and then 
when the time comes for the victim to speak up, the family, the community says, oh, well, they're such a good person. They couldn't possibly be doing this. How dare you attack them? And that shuts people down. It's, it's a very effective tactic um, that keeps abusers in power and prevents the people they've abused from actually speaking up. Thank you for that, Rose. Um, I wanna open this up to some questions. I see a question from Kurt, one thing that might be nice to hear from folks on um, the call might be first steps um, one might take to uh, when leaving a course of group and, and local resources. We will be um, touching on that again, um, the resources with the Women's Center and or um, community care and community safety plans. That's, that's gonna be like step two of this. And I'd like to invite um, T and, and Elizabeth to be a, a, a huge, like the leaders of that group and maybe the Women's Center could just facilitate that space um, and work in conjunction to, with them to, to help further those conversations. I have conversations all the time with people about community care, but um, when we're talking about something this niche or this specific, I think um, Rose and I could really just be there to facilitate and take a, a back seat while um, T and Elizabeth um, take the front seat and just kind of, of, of talk about that. So if you're interested in that, um, you can reach out to um, me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that. You can reach out to the Women's Center um, and, and I'll, I'll talk all about that um, in our last few minutes. But right now, um, any specific questions? And, and the one element we did not um, discuss, so if, if anybody has a question about this, um, peer pressure to ensure that you're constantly being watched, coerced, controlled, and shaped by the entire group into conforming and, and using that external enemy as that way of coercive control. Um, because people are wired to have this sense of belonging, belonging being vulnerable to people, um, um, being vulnerable, like people in general, right, are just easily coerced into systems of behavior through use of peer pressure. Um, and a, a lot of the people in the chat have, have connected to your stories and, and shared their in, intricate knowledge of, of their own experiences with coercive control and manipulation. Um, anybody on the chat have a question or, or something else that they want to share with the entire group? I, I'm not going to read the entire chat. So if you if you have something that you really wanted to to, to be said, please um, copy and paste it or you know type in a question. I just wanted to touch on that point about um, when if you're planning on leaving or feeling like you want to leave. Um, one of the things that we do when we're working with people, when someone calls up the hotline and is like, I'm in an abusive situation, I'm scared, I, you know, I don't feel safe, we do safety planning. And obviously it looks different when you're getting out of a group like this versus when you're getting out of, you know, a relationship. But the first thing we do is make sure that people are, feel physically safe, that they are, you know, that they are not in immediate bodily danger. And we want to make sure that they are emotionally safe as well, because ev and every single safety plan looks different because every single person's needs are different. But the first, I mean, the first thing to do is to sort of, is sort of to prepare, prepare your, yourself, prepare your mind. Um, sometimes things like making sure that you have access to like identifying documents, like your birth certificate, your social security card, things like that. Um, and if you, if you are planning on getting away, um, and if you have copies of those, you know, that's something that keeping that kind of stuff is, is one of the most important things. And if you're able to, to save some of the money that you might be tithing or things like that, um, to get, because we live in a capitalist society, you need money to get around, you need money to do things. Um, but it's so, you know, call us up if you need 
a specific safety plan, we'd, we'd be happy to help. It's true. I want to mention that we do have um, a network of advocates with connections to about every so social service agency, not only in Southern Illinois, but we have governing bodies in both um, the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault and ICADV, um, the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence that help us. And so we are not only connected throughout the state, but throughout the nation to other service providers if you need to relocate. Um, we have advocates and counselors. All of our services are free and confidential. Um, I do have a question. Um, how should the larger Carbondale community respond to the local cult based on the new information you have shared? This is a good question. Um, I think that, and I know Todd will have something to add to this. Um, it's been a game changer for me. And what part of why I'm out here right now talking is the amount of support and um, acceptance um, that I've had as the story unfolds. And so um, just being willing to listen <laughs> and also question, you know, the, the um, there's a lot of systems at play. There's a lot, this, this, the group has been part of this community for a long time. And, you know, that whole, what you talked about, like with this um, deny and attack and, that that's in full effect. It was when I was in, it already is now with all of this um, happening um, to be aware of that, I guess. And, uh, you know, I've heard the term cancel culture. I've been thinking a lot about that a lot. And I think really it is thrown around a lot by, um, it's this perfect tool in a way to use to victimize yourself and ignore the fact that, um, you know, not holding space for things that you don't believe in and don't want to support abusive behaviors is perfectly acceptable and okay and fine. And we need more of it actually. Um, and that's different than like not being willing to listen to different views or anything like that. Because I do think too, there's, there's different, you know, people, there are some people in the group, they're completely financially dependent. Everything is, is intertwined for them with the group. They are living in community property. They don't have jobs proper. They don't have a savings. And so just to know now, I mean, what it means for me just to know now that what you're saying is those people have a space. Cause I think to separate yourself is so important to commit, to create distance. And so, um, I think some of it's already happening and just more understanding. A lot has happened a lot in, the, in a short amount of time just from public opinion. Um, and so many people have had this moment. So John in the chat, this moment of like, oh my God, you know, I. And, and again, I just want to repeat that the stories are worse than you're hearing tonight. So, um, and a lot of people have said to me, but, you know, I mean, a year ago, people were like, well, should we go to the businesses still? And, I, and at first I was like, well, you decide. And now I'm like, no, <laughs> like, like, um, I'm going to say this. I'm going to use some words here, which might sound extreme, but they are not. Um, the not-for-profit with which we are very familiar is run by human servants. Um, we use the word slaves sometimes in the group. Um, and I mean that. So people are like, does it really go to the, you know, the benefactors? I'm going to be vague about this, but sort of like, well, isn't that a good cause? It's like, well, yeah. And the people who run it here work for free for hours and it's never good enough. And so I wanna to say to you, what you can do is 
continue the one by one word of mouth education of when your friend says like, hey, let's go to the restaurant and you go like, no, this is what I know about it, no. And then, and then gradually we, you know, we do our very best to um, help the town and the people who are still actively being hurt in our neighborhoods, help them uh, lessen their means, decrease their means for fully functioning in our midst. And, you know, at the same time, you know, I want other people to do this because I'm just recovering. Like I'm trying to like get my life back. So y'all have at it. Like I'm not organizing <laughs> and I'm not being caught in the same, I'm not being caught on the campaign. I'm not doing that. I'm sharing my experience. So what you can do is you can actively speak to it when you inevitably run on those people, run of those people who are like, yeah, but they have great muffins or whatever. It's like, or yeah, but the the they're you know they're raising money for a good cause. It's like you don't know what it's like to be in there. And it's tricky because if you ask the people who are currently in there, what's that like? Are you being abused? I'd be like, no, it's great. And if you had asked me that a year and a half ago, I would have said that same thing. It's very tricky. But yeah, please draw a line for yourself and explain to people. And if and if they want, some people are like, well, I've heard it's a rumor. It's a rumor. You know, we want first-hand information. Then you send them to us. <laughs> and we'll go, well, here's what we know. Here's our personal experiences with the group. Yeah. Somebody, I had an experience recently with somebody saying rumor, and I'm like, at least say allegation. You know what I mean? Rumor seems dismissive, and we're 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 past that point now. Um, you know, I've personally talked to so many people, and you know, basically, yeah, I'm finding out things that I never knew during, you know, that were taking place. And as Todd said, it's worse than we imagine. And we haven't hit the bottom yet. We don't know, we don't know, you know, what's next. Um, yeah. Okay, two more questions. Um, can an organization or community like this change or continue to exist beyond the guru being deposed? What else would need to happen? or is the organization unsalvageable? Wow, that's a big one. That's tricky too, but we we do know now of a, a, a kind of satellite group where a lot of members or a group of members are left together. Um, and it's so much to shift, to sift through and uh, I personally think that um, it would depend on the amount of. I, I would be a, I I would be leery of that, but but I know that there have been calls um, for him to leave. But I I don't think knowing him that he would ever lose he would ever give up control. And so I don't trust that. And um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the people who are really experienced in this area, like Yanya, they're, they're like, no, they don't change. <laughs> like, don't even think, expect it. Um, there's a, yeah, it can't be expected. Um, yeah, that's. People can get out, like, like Elizabeth just said, but you know, there's some there's some local media that's gonna happen soon. And um, it's gonna be quite intense for people to hear. And based on some things that have come out within the group, like Elizabeth said, there's been a pretty, there's been a very, very major fissure very recently, like unlike, I've, unlike we've seen in more than 20 years. So it's, that's all happening behind the scenes. It takes, mm -hmm. and it takes, it takes a long time for, survivors to speak if they ever do because it's so painful you know so um 
But also one of the most powerful things for me has been hearing the stories of people that have left before, or, you know what I mean, that you knew that left. And then, you know, you never necessarily knew some of the details or the details you were given weren't, were not, were not true, weren't, weren't the truth of the matter. And then to hear their stories, you know, that has been, um, wow, that's been really powerful and it's still happening. And I imagine that it's, it will continue. Pulling at that thread, I want to offer our last question because we do need to wrap up. It is already eight, but we're going to go just a little bit over time because of the importance and the weight of, of this subject matter. Last question. How can we best offer our support to those folks who are still financially and otherwise dependent? I mean, it's really tricky because, you know, like, I'm the person no one's supposed to listen to and I will offer help. But I, you know, this is, let me take this back to the Women's Center because Carly, what you've done, or let me just, not, let me per, not personalize it. What the Women's Center has done by reaching out to us is so moving because you believe us, you've sort of legitimized us in the framework of how you're operating. You've offered services, you've offered guest room or like, you know, meeting space. And, and for me, it's kind of like, amazingly uh, beautiful and validating to think because you all are you know how to do this you know how to provide services so I feel like somehow going forward we should you know partner with you uh, as a way of creating some kind of visible support that says yes. like hey we're here and because because you know I I'm trying to get my life together. Like we can't privately do that. You know, if somebody pops out that I've known for 20 years and they're like, help, you know, they of course can stay here personally, but that's not a good mm -hmm. system. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what I'm saying, Elizabeth? Yeah. Yes. We, we even are um, in kind of smaller groups have been like, I live in Carbondale. If you needed a place to stay, you can, but I can also see um, why people leaving might, you know, that might not feel completely safe. And so I'd say mm -hmm. support the women's center and um, we are, um, hopefully as this continues, we will have resources that are kind of more readily available, you know, um, but just what you said tonight is, well, the Women's Center is one of those resources. Um, and I know that Todd said this and before about, well, if somebody showed up and they needed a place to stay, you know, they could have it. Um, I know between the two of us it, locally, that would be the case, but that might not be the, the answer for everybody, but I'm, it means a lot to know that those resources are there. Well, I just wanna thank all of our panelists again, especially, I just wanna personally thank Elizabeth Donahue and T. Brown for um, all of the conversations and, and your, your personal points of view and just recounting Recounting these stories can be re-traumatizing and, and your willingness to do this to, to come from an educational stance so people can understand and um, be aware of, about the community care that's needed, about the community safety plans that are needed, and we can start taking next steps is, is truly appreciated and, and valued. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the Carbondale Public Library for hosting us on, on their Zoom platform. So thank you so much to specifically Jennifer Robertson and the, couple, the Carbondale Public Library for their time, energy, and, and space. Um, I wanna thank uh, my colleague, my dear colleague, Rose Berkman. Um, fantastic, um, just fantastic job with, 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 you know, with making sure that we're, we're, you know, keeping on track with, okay, this is the psychology behind this. This is what's happening. Yes, you know, and, and just validating our panelists. So, so thank you for that. And um, thank you again to Yanya, even though um, she had to, to jump off and, and grab dinner, but, um, and, you know, just be a human being, right? But um, thank you to Alon Yanya for her framework and um, for her comments and, and everyone's comments in here. I, um, I am wrapping up, but I am going to be discussing some, some next steps. So just like give me one more minute um, of your time. Um, again, I just want to thank all of our panelists. It is October and October at the Women's Center means to us Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I want to remind everyone that abuse can happen to anyone 
and remind those who are watching at home that we do serve the whole community. We serve everyone in the community. Um, for that reason, soon we will be changing our name to reflect those values. The Women's Center, as it's called right now, serves all survivors and their nonviolent family members who are impacted by the trauma of abuse. Uh, coercion and manipulation are the tools of power and control and are intrinsically tied to domestic and interpersonal violence. If you're in immediate danger, don't hesitate, just call 911, of course. But if you need to seek advocacy, counseling, education for current or past abuse, please reach out to our hotline. Our hotline is 1-800-334-2094. Again, the number is 1-800-334-2094. If you would like to, um, to create a community safety plan or start a conversation about community care and safety, you can reach out to me. I'm the prevention specialist. Um, my name is Carly Copley. Um, you can reach me at um, extension 264. And I'd be happy to you know, help start the conversation with T and Elizabeth and just kind of vet people so, so they can be and have, have the, the safety and, and you know just have their own human experience right now. Um, but again, I want to invite T and, and Elizabeth to, to help us with our next steps about creating community safety plans and conversations of community care for Carbondale. Um, the Women's Center, just we appreciate all of our Southern Illinois communities and our sole existence. The, the reason that we exist is to empower survivors. So again, I want to thank um, T and Elizabeth for, for being here tonight. So, and thank you to, to everyone in the chat that that shared your stories as well. Um, thank you. That was, you know, that sense of community and rebuilding that sense of community is very important. So thank you all. Um, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful evening and um, do something fun and do something to take care of yourselves and start thinking of ways that you can support people in the community that, that need our support. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.